The Earth's magnetic field is weakening and the magnetic poles are drifting. The constellation of swarm satellites is attempting to find out what's happening at the molten core of our planet. Gemini 7, are you able to see in the windows of 6 very easily and vice versa? The combined Gemini 6 and 7 missions had flown in formation, but an original objective for two craft to join together in orbit, a process known as docking, could not be attempted because Gemini 6's Agena target vehicle had exploded just after launch. We could uh, very clearly see the right scanners operating. All remaining Gemini missions would include rendezvous and docking, and Gemini 8, with first-time astronauts Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott, would be next. All NASA astronauts must be qualified pilots, and the Space Agency operates its own wing of T-38 jet trainers. To keep their flying hours up, astronauts often fly themselves between facilities across the United States in one of these two-seaters. Elliot C. and Charles Bassett, the astronauts slated to fly Gemini 9, died in poor weather conditions when their T-38 crashed into a building at the McDonnell Aircraft Plant in St. Louis. They were going to inspect their spacecraft. Gemini 9 would become Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan's mission. Each flight had a backup crew that could take over at short notice. NASA was still in a hurry. On March the 16th, 1966, Gemini 8 waited on launch pad 19, while an Agena target vehicle waited on pad 14. The Agena would launch 95 minutes before the Gemini craft, and the two would dock about six hours after launch. But docking was not the only aim of the Gemini 8 mission. Dave Scott was due to make America's second spacewalk. There had been setbacks in the Gemini program and this flight was aimed at catching up. As Armstrong and Scott were being strapped into their craft, the Agena was in the final seconds of its countdown. Two, one. Mission controller's faith in the Agena had been shaken after the previous vehicle had blown up at the ignition of the second stage. But soon after its launch, there was confirmation that this Agena would be waiting correctly in orbit when Gemini 8 arrived. The Agena was supposed to be controllable from the ground or from the spacecraft, but because there had been difficulty in receiving information from the target craft, Mission Control still had doubts about the Agena's attitude control system. Prior to docking, the crew were warned to turn the Agena system off if it gave trouble. The docking manoeuvre went so smoothly that ground crew were at first uncertain that it had really happened. But soon there were problems as the linked craft began spinning and not responding to control. Immediately, Armstrong undocked, but the spin got worse with the astronauts in danger of passing out. They initiated an emergency return to Earth. Later analysis exonerated the Agena revealing that one of the Gemini craft's thrusters had remained stuck on. The flight had lasted less than 11 hours. The two craft had only stayed docked for 30 minutes and there had been no spacewalk. Yet mission planners noted a couple
calm and professional way that Armstrong had handled what could have been a tragedy. Armstrong and Scott splashed down in the Pacific near Japan, the only Gemini craft not to land in the Atlantic. After the failure of the Atlas Agena target vehicle for the original Gemini 6 mission, its makers were relieved that it had performed well for the Gemini 8 mission. Some said difficulties had been due to the mix of different companies building the thing, with Convair making the Atlas first stage, Lockheed making the upper Agena stage, and McDonnell responsible for the docking adapter. In May 1966, GATV-9 was prepared for launch. It would be Gemini 9's docking target. two minutes went perfectly, but after that, a short caused the right booster engine to gimbal hard over. The rocket flipped and headed back toward the ocean where it crashed. Convair accepted responsibility. As with Gemini 6, this left two astronauts sitting in a fully fueled Titan with nowhere to go. Tom Stafford, who'd been involved in two on-pad aborts with Gemini 6, and now this with Gemini 9, was nicknamed the Mayor of Pad 19. But this time, a standby docking vehicle was available. The upper stage had no propulsion, but it did have a docking collar. It launched two weeks later. Gemini 9, now renamed Gemini 9A, was to follow shortly. But three minutes before the scheduled blast-off, ground computers lost contact with the Gemini computers. With only a 40-second window, the launch was scrubbed. Two days later, they tried again. This would be the sixth time Commander Stafford had been strapped in, with only one mission completed. Stafford and Cernan quickly caught up with their orbiting target. But something else had gone wrong. It looks like an angry alligator out here rotating around. The protective shroud had not come away. Inexperienced technicians had taped down the fiberglass lanyards and they kept the two pieces together. Stafford dubbed it the angry alligator. Engineers on the ground desperately sought a solution, but there was just too much risk to the astronauts. There would be no docking on this mission. Next, Cernan left the capsule. He was to test a new manoeuvring unit, but his heart rate rose so alarmingly that the doctors ordered him back inside. He was overheating and his helmet had fogged. John Young would command the next mission, Gemini 10. His partner would be Michael Collins making his first flight. He was also due to make the next spacewalk and was training in a cradle floating on air. This was to give him practice using the zip gun, but so far the spacewalks were presenting unexpected difficulties due to overexertion. This looked relaxing. Two, one. The Gemini flights were starting to conform to a pattern with an Agena target vehicle launching 100 minutes before the manned spacecraft. This time, there were no launch delays. The astronauts had a busy schedule, having to make up for the shortcomings of the two previous flights. The Agena was waiting for them exactly as intended. Rendezvous was now becoming routine. Young and Collins caught up with it 
and after almost six hours, they had docked. Gemini 10 used an 80 second burst from the Agena's engine to boost them to a higher orbit, where they visited an Agena from the Gemini 8 flight. Their rendezvous and docking exercises had gone well, but activity outside the spacecraft had still been difficult, with the inflated spacesuit limiting movement and important equipment being lost. On the following Gemini 11 flight, Richard Gordon also had great difficulty performing effectively outside the craft. NASA came up with a new training technique, one that they use to this day. Scuba diving had been seen as good training for fitness and regular breathing. Now they'd built a mock-up of the gemini agena combination in a high school swimming pool in Baltimore. With just 60 days before Gemini 12, Buzz Aldrin began practicing his scheduled routine. In addition to his spacesuit, he carried 28 kilograms of lead to give him a neutral buoyancy. A clip-on tether was designed to solve the problem that previous astronauts had had just staying in one place. Detailed feedback from Aldrin helped engineers position handholds to make extravehicular activity, EVA, more precise. November the 11th, 1966, and the pad crew were all there for the final Gemini mission. Commander James Lovell and his pilot Buzz Aldrin arrived at their rocket with placards on their backs saying, The End. Many of the team wishing them farewell had spent years on this project. There had been a suggestion that Gemini 12 should be delayed to coincide with the first launch in the Apollo series, but delays with the new spacecraft and its giant booster made this unfeasible. Rendezvous with the Agena was as expected, but on the ground, an anomaly in telemetry data suggested that the Agena's main engine could give problems, so they cancelled the boost to a higher orbit as had been intended. Lovell docked the two craft. The next day, when Aldrin opened the hatch and moved outside, Everything was different. The handrails made an immense difference. The gradual and deliberate way Aldrin moved gave no problems with exertion or overheating. He easily completed all his tasks, including attaching a tether between the Gemini and the Agena. When the spacecraft undocked, they remained connected. This is a technique NASA wanted to test, but it has not been used since. Project Gemini had ended on a high note. Jim Lovell had set a new record for the most hours in space and his pilot, Buzz Aldrin, had more EVA hours than anyone else. The Gemini missions had achieved all they had set out to do. But ahead, there was an even bigger goal, and a much bigger rocket was being developed to make it happen. Nobody realised just how difficult the next stage would be. The Curiosity rover is giving us a clearer picture of the Red Planet's early years. Mm -hmm. 
August the 6th, 2012, and NASA's Curiosity rover is safely on the surface of Mars. Early weeks were devoted to reprogramming the rover and calibrating its suite of instruments. The rover had landed in Gale Crater, a scar left after a meteor impact more than three billion years ago. Gale Crater had been chosen because it shows signs that water had once been present. Curiosity is focused on water and its effect on the early years of the Red Planet, particularly whether it could have supported life. The rover is fitted with a number of specialist cameras. On the central mast are two cameras that provide images in true colour and their sensitivity extends beyond the visual spectrum. One camera has a 15 degree field of view while the other provides a narrower 5 degree view. Both have 8 gigabytes of flash memory. Curiosity has two computers. They coordinate the radio transmissions back to Earth, either directly, via the X-band transmitter, or with UHF, via the Mars orbiters. Relay via the orbiters is preferable, as it gives a higher data rate. Also on the rover's mast are two black and white navigation cameras, designed to deliver a 3D view for ground crew, plotting the path the rover will take. Curiosity's first major destination was Mount Sharp, rising 5,500 metres above the crater floor. But it took around two years to get there, as the terrain is littered with features that the planetary investigators want to examine. The rover is capable of navigating autonomously, but it still relies on instructions from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to set short-range destinations. The images, backed up by chemical analysis, show unequivocally that water was once present at this site. Also housed in Curiosity's mast is a laser that works in conjunction with a suite of instruments known as ChemCam. From as far as seven meters, it can vaporize a tiny sample and analyze its chemical composition. If a rock bears closer examination, a drill at the end of the rover's robotic arm can extract a sample. The arm also has an X-ray spectrometer and an imager able to capture pictures down to microscopic detail. extracted from the rock is poured into the aperture of the Chem-Min instrument. Using X-rays, the instrument can identify the mineral content of the rock. The first samples that Curiosity tested revealed sulphur, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus and carbon. Yet there have been problems. Just months into its mission, the primary computer went into safe mode. Using the backup computer, it took JPL staff three days to restore the system. And Curiosity's light metal wheels are starting to show signs of damage. Some of the rocks are both so jagged and firmly fixed into the Martian soil that the rover drivers are having to think more carefully about the paths they select. The rover has two radiation detectors, and information from these suggests that a manned mission to the Red Planet would not be unduly troubled by excessive levels of radiation. The next phase of Curiosity's assignment will see it climb the slopes of Mount Sharp. Mission specialists are excited about the different strata of rock they expect to find. The swarm satellites are trying to find out why our planet's magnetic field is so erratic.
A stream of charged particles emanates from the sun. Known as the solar wind, it flows throughout the solar system. During extreme solar activity, coronal mass ejections bombard the planets. The Earth is largely protected by its magnetic field, but at polar regions, where the magnetic field lines converge, charged particles can spiral down and interact with the upper atmosphere, manifesting as auroras. We know from the Earth's geological record that the poles flip unpredictably from between 100,000 to 50 million years. And over the past 150 years, the Earth's magnetic field has declined in intensity by about 15%. To find out more about our planet's fluctuating magnetic field, the European Space Agency launched a trio of magnetic observation satellites known as SWARM. The three identical satellites measure both the strength and direction of the Earth's magnetic field as it continues to evolve. An hour after launch, they each deployed a magnetometer positioned at the end of a boom to isolate it from any stray fields generated by the satellite's electronics. Called Alpha, Bravo and Charlie, the trio were accurately delivered to north-south orbits at a height of 490 kilometres. The oscillations of the boom would take several minutes to stabilise. Over time, Alpha and Charlie will follow the same path and their orbits will be allowed to decay. Bravo will maintain its launch altitude, but it's gradually drifting to a different orbital plane. This will allow researchers to gain a three-dimensional view of the magnetosphere. Though most of the Earth's magnetic field is generated by movement within the molten iron core, some magnetism is retained in areas of rock and saltwater currents in the oceans also contribute. The swarm satellites will enable researchers to build a dynamic map of the planet's interior. They want to understand why the magnetic field is diminishing and why the Earth's magnetic poles are drifting. 780,000 years ago, the magnetic poles flipped and researchers want to know whether the present fluctuations are symptoms of the approach of another field reversal. A weak area in the magnetosphere above the South Atlantic allows the solar wind to penetrate to lower altitudes. More satellites fail passing above this region than at any other place. The knowledge gained from Swarm has implications beyond sensitive electronics. Continued weakening of the magnetic field will allow more solar radiation to reach the Earth's surface with implications for all living things.